these men had won their struggle for power. They now ruled all of Germany. But still they had trouble with their oldest and most persistent enemy, the truth. They found that truth does not die easily. And so they decided to abolish truth. One great source of truth is literature. So they burned books, 20 million of them. Many great men in Germany who were spokesmen for truth were jailed or driven from their country. Teachers, writers, scientists. Education was discouraged. In five years, college attendance dropped 53%. It was forbidden to listen to a British radio program or read an American newspaper. In Nazi Germany, you had to get your information from Dr. Goebbels. He knew what was best for you. The church was one force in Germany still strong enough to proclaim the truth in public. This Catholic priest was arrested the following day on charges of immorality. The Protestant church also continued to try and fight for truth. The Nazis put this man in a concentration camp. There were others who spoke for truth, and I am proud to say that educators were among them. And what, may I ask, is an Aryan? I don't know myself. But let us see what our present so-called authorities have to say about it. They say he is tall. Slender. Blue-eyed. And blonde. There is no Aryan race. And more important, there is no master race. There are people who may find these ideas convenient, but science cannot support them. There is no scientific proof that there is any correlation between a man's racial characteristics and his native ability or character. In all racial groups, we find the same range of potentialities. We find idiots and geniuses. We find criminals and philanthropists. We must judge each man as an individual and not by the color of his skin or his eyes or by the length of his nose. Come in, gentlemen. It's comfortable. And remember that there is no master race. That is a scientific truth. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. And so for all practical purposes, truth had been abolished in Germany. A lot of my German friends wondered what had hit them. How did it happen? Where did it start? It started right here. And this was where it could have been stopped. If those people had stood together, if they had protected each other, they could have resisted the Nazi threat. Together they would have been strong. But once they allowed themselves to be split apart, they were helpless. When that first minority lost out, Everybody lost that. They made the mistake of gambling with other people's freedom. Now let's see how those bets paid off. Carl the farmer was gambling on a better life for himself. What he got was extra hours of back-breaking work, as much as a hundred hours a week. He was forced to stay on his land and produce what he was told to produce, because now Hitler was preparing for war. For Heinrich, who owned a hardware store, the bet didn't pay off either. 104,000 small businesses were closed in two years. And for Hans, conditions hadn't improved any. He had a job now in the munitions factory, but he worked long hours for little pay. The working conditions grew increasingly bad. And even though he didn't like the job, 
he wasn't permitted to leave it. And when Hitler decided the time was right, Germany went to war. Not by declaring war, but by a carefully prepared sneak attack. Once again, Hitler needed Hans to do his dirty work. Hans was an expert at brutality this time. And Hitler had decided to use Hans and his brutality against other peoples. The Czechs, the Poles, the French, the Russians. But in the crucial test of war, Hitler's race theories didn't pay off. His pure-blooded supermen were defeated by the mongrel armies he despised. By the British of El Alamein. By the Russians at Stalingrad. Then on D-Day by American soldiers of every color and religion who smashed across the Normandy beaches and drove on through to the heart of Germany. For the misguided Germans who had swallowed the Nazi bait, the Nazi game did not pay off. The continent of Europe was strewn with millions of German bodies, pure Aryan bodies. Karl, the farmer, was left in the snow outside of Moscow. Heinrich stayed in Italy at Salerno. And Hans, who was going to rule the world, got only a little patch of Normandy that he could call his own. We must never let that happen to us or to our country. We must never let ourselves be divided by race or color or religion, because in this country we all belong to minority groups. I was born in Hungary. You are a Mason. These are minorities. And then you belong to other minority groups, too. You are a farmer, you have blues, you go to the Methodist church. Your right to belong to these minorities is a precious thing. You have a right to be what you are and say what you think, because here we have personal freedom, we have liberty. And these are not just fancy words. This is a practical and priceless way of living. But we must work at it. We must guard everyone's liberty, or we can lose our own. If we allow any minority to lose its freedom by persecution or by prejudice, we are threatening our own freedom. And this is not simply an idea. This is good, hard common sense. You see, here in America is not a question whether we tolerate minorities. America is minorities. And that means you and me. Let's not be suckers. We must not allow the freedom or dignity of any man to be threatened by any act or word. Let's be selfish about it. Let's forget about we and they. Let's think about us. <laughs> 